IQ. You may have heard this term often enough, being randomly thrown around to refer to someone's intelligence or competence or perceived level of knowledge or education or lack thereof. But IQ isn't some fuzzy concept which vaguely refers to someone being smart. It's a concrete scientific metric which tries to measure a set of very critical mental capabilities. Said mental capabilities have a positive correlation with a host of real life outcomes at the individual level such as academic success, financial success, career growth, civic sense, marital stability, etc. But quite importantly, average IQ is also able to predict national success to a very large degree. One of the most famous works in which a strong positive correlation was shown between GDP per capita and national IQ was the book IQ and the Wealth of Nations. Richard Lynn and Tatu Van Hanen, who authored the book, found that there was a correlation of 0.82 between a country's IQ and GDP per capita. For those who are not very familiar with statistical terminology, when we talk about correlation, we are basically talking about how strongly two variables are related to each other. The correlation coefficient is always calculated between minus 1 and 1 with minus 1 being perfectly negative or inverse correlation and 1 being perfectly positive or direct correlation. Thus a correlation coefficient of 0.82 indicates a very strong positive correlation between IQ and GDP per capita. Of course to be fair it can be argued and it has been argued that the data with which Lin and Van Hanen were working with was incomplete or in many cases entirely built upon related data for example for countries which did not have quality iq testing data available an average based on their neighboring countries scores was used however more recent research in which much more comprehensive data on national iq has been compiled together by david becker also shows us the same result that there is a very strong positive correlation between iq and gdp per capita What is generally observed is that East Asian countries have average IQs ranging from 103 to 107 while most countries where the population is of European stock tend to have average IQs of around 95 to 100. Latin America, the Arab world, South Asia and other such similar brown countries are generally placed in the 70s to 80s while black sub-Saharan African countries are even lower generally tending to be in the 60s to 70s. If you do a little bit of quick googling you will notice that there is definitely a strong correlation between these scores and the per capita GDPs of these countries although of course it is not a perfect correlation for example if you have a country with an average IQ in the 80s but it has vast amounts of oil wealth then it may even do better than a country with an average IQ of 100 but very limited natural resources Interestingly enough apart from IQ tests other tests such as PISA or the program for international student assessment scores also tend to have a very strong correlation with the country's economic well-being the reason for this is that PISA and other standardized tests like the SAT in the US which is used for college admissions are also heavily G loaded now what do we mean when we use this term G loaded this refers to the ability of a particular test to measure something known as the general intelligence factor or g factor of intelligence which is the common cognitive factor which enables an individual to perform better at nearly all tasks involving the use of intelligence the g factor is critical to this whole discussion precisely because the g factor is highly heritable with some studies done on monozygotic twins showing that g factor heritability can be as high as 86% Heritability is often the primary clashing point between people who believe in IQ as a good measure of intelligence and those who do not. Some people say that rich countries have higher IQs because they have better environmental factors such as better education systems and better nutrition. But this argument only goes so far. Due to the heritable nature of the G factor, there is a genetic ceiling to which an individual scores in an IQ test or other G loaded tests may increase even with optimal nutrition and environmental factors. This is what is commonly known as genotypic IQ. On the other hand, we have phenotypic IQ, which is IQ that is actually reflected in tests and can be different from genotypic IQ if that person has had a poor education or inadequate nutrition during childhood. But the key fact remains that a person or a population's IQ for that matter cannot be raised beyond the set genotypic IQ which represents a ceiling. Thus, for example, we did see major gains in average IQ across many western countries in the 20th century 
and this is commonly known as the flynn effect to understand what we mean by gains in average iq you need to understand how iq tests are standardized in the first place there is a large sample size of test takers taken for the purpose of standardization such that the average score is 100 and the standard deviation is usually 15 or 16 iq tests are re-standardized again and again over time with newer samples to ensure that the average remains 100 and the standard deviation remains consistent as well now what the flynn effect basically showed is that on average people in the late 20th century performed much higher than the average score of 100 when they took iq tests standardized in the first half of the 20th century similarly another study found that if the sample of test takers from the us in 1932 was taken and compared with the value scored in on a version of the test normalized in 1997 then their average score would only be 80 and not 100 Unfortunately, the Flynn effect has gone into reverse mode in recent years, and a number of reasons such as dysgenic fertility and the hitting of the genotypic IQ limit have been attributed to the said decline. Nevertheless, there are still potentially huge gains to be made in terms of reaching India's full genotypic IQ potential, which some writers have commented could be as high as 95. Of course, any possible gains from the Flynn effect in India could to a large extent be compromised by severe dysgenic fertility and outward migration of India's higher IQ groups on a related note it has to also be specifically kept in mind that apart from the average IQ of a population the way that IQ is distributed also has a huge role to play in a country's economic potential those countries which have wider IQ bell curves which are fatter at the tail ends have higher numbers of both extremely smart and extremely stupid people This greater variation in IQ among the population is believed to lead to greater economic vitality as the so-called smart fraction of a population has a disproportionately important role to play in its productivity. That is why East Asian countries with average IQs 5 to 7 points higher than Western countries tend to either have the same or even less per capita GDP compared to those countries as the former have very narrow IQ bell curves with relatively fewer outliers. The smart fraction theory may be one of the few reasons for optimism about India's future among a sea of red. That too however can be easily overwhelmed by the many many problems associated with not just dysgenics and emigration but also with institutional decline and cutthroat tribalistic warfare in our electoral politics. That is all for now folks. I hope you enjoyed watching this video. Do subscribe to my channel for more such content in the future. Goodbye.